Um, we're on a series that we just simply titled 1%. The title of this message is Habits. The first week we talked about words. The second week we talked about your thoughts. And today we're gonna talk about habits or slash disciplines. So I'll interchange those words somewhat. So here's our thought process as continuous improvement is a dedication to making small changes and improvements in our lives. Knowing that those small improvements will help do something great, fulfilling in our lives. We just need to work on getting 1% better. This means spend 14 minutes and 24 seconds of your day to get better in some area, to study it, to meditate on it, to work on it. 14 minutes and 24 seconds is 1%. And our habits are important because they create our destiny. We can also call them disciplines, which I said earlier, because we are what we repeatedly do. Whatever we repeatedly do, that's really who we are. We can tell people who we are, but what we repeatedly do is who we are. And we are all disciplined people. Some people say, I'm not disciplined. I'm not, you will change that answer here in a moment. We are all disciplined people because by definition, we have disciplines or habits that we are doing consistently. We have some that are good and some that aren't so good. But either way, you're disciplined. Someone may say, I'm not a disciplined person because I'm overweight or I'm unhealthy or I eat junk food. And even if you say all those things, you're still disciplined in those areas. That's your habit. Like me, I love Oreo cookies. Not the single stuff when they gotta be double stuffed. And, and I, I like them, and I'll tell you why I like them, because they're vegan. Google it. I think they're putting it on the package now. Vegan, they don't have any dairy in it. And so I get my vegan on when I'm eating Oreos. My wife would say, those aren't good for you. I said, they're vegan. Come on, it's my health food for the moment. I'm a vegan or whatever, I'm kidding. I'm... But, but I like it, so it's a habit. Usually after I eat a meal, I'll go eat two. I'll only grab two cookies, and then I'll go sit down and eat them, and then I'll get back up and get two more because I want to get a little workout in between. But the truth is, whether we like to hear it or not, you are a disciplined person. You are disciplined in doing whatever you do, good or bad. It's a discipline, it's a habit. Bottom line is, we are all disciplined, we just don't always have the right disciplines, come on. And so we're talking about habits, disciplines. Discipline is simply our habits, is choosing between what we want now and what we want most. So we, we have a choice, and part of being disciplined is learning to choose what I want most over what I want or feel now. What is the best thing for me to do? See, we are all successful in some area of our lives. And when we look into those areas, we find consistent disciplines, whether they're good or bad. We find them, we find this is what I do, this is my trigger, this is what happens, this is my thinking processes. So we gotta learn to think better, talk better, and then act better. Romans chapter seven, if you would, verses 14 through 25, this is the Apostle Paul writing to us, the church. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. In other words, the trouble's not with the word of God, it, because it's spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human. How many of y'all can say that? And if you're not, you need to go live in Roswell, because that's where all the aliens live. People used to ask me all the time on planes, I always wait, waited for it. Where are, you, where are you from? Roswell, America. Because there's a Roswell, Georgia, so you got, you know, Roswell, New Mexico, and they go, oh, have you ever seen any aliens? It always happened, like, and you know what I tell them? And then I tell them, I'm a pastor, and all I do is get people saved, I just never ask them what planet they're from. <laughs> and then they get that look on their face like, 
Okay, I'll leave you alone. That's, thank you. <laughs> For I'm all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, see, we all can. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree with the law of God, or the law is good. In other words, we agree with the word of God. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives, with, lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Does anybody relate to this besides me? I'm like reading my life. I'm reading this like it's me. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. How many in here relate to this, but you love God? You really do, you care, you're okay. And so, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind, and this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. We have a sin nature, every one of us sins and comes short of the glory of God, every one of us. So that's why I can't stand those religious folks that always want to point their finger at everybody and, and point out all their faults and want to spread all their stuff all over the church. It's like spreading manure, except it's called gossip. And it really should make us all mad because all it does is hurt people. People come up to me sometimes over the years and they've said, well, you need to, do, and I'm like, who, who, wait, stop, who? Who made you the Holy Spirit in God? And how is it that you get to go criticize other people because they've made mistakes? The one making the biggest mistake is the one pointing the finger. Oh, what a miserable man, or what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God, here's the answer. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. The only way we can overcome sin in our life is to recognize that the law, the word of God, is good and spiritual, and you must receive Jesus into your heart. That's the only way you can get forgiven of those sins and God help you to, get, to remove them from your life. In a way, Paul is saying, this is what he's saying. Okay, you ready? In a way, he's saying, I want to eat a salad, but those pizzas and tacos look too good. <laughs> How many of y'all can relate to that? So last night, I ate pizza, salad, and Oreo cookies. <laughs> Such a healthy diet. By nature, we are not self-disciplined. By nature, sin pulls us away from God, what he wants us to do. Our sin nature bends us to, toward doing what is wrong rather than doing what is right. A lot of times with God, we've got to do what's right regardless of how we feel, what we see, what we think. We just do what's right, and then he'll make things right. He cleans up the mud. We want to do what is right, but our sin nature lures us away from God and tempts us to do what is right wrong. So Paul answers the questions to our predicament. Who can help me overcome the temptation? Who can help me walk away from sin? Who can help me become more consistent? Who can help me have the right disciplines? Who can deliver me? And the answer is, in Jesus Christ our Lord, with his help, I can, we can be different. Amen. With his help, I can change. With his help, we can change. By his power, we can be transformed. Christ in me is still stronger than the wrong appetites that are within me. And that's what we have to understand. You'll never get free until you come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, you will make mistakes. That's why the Bible says the righteous gets up seven times. In other words, the righteous ones, excuse me, never lay down and stay down. 
You know, the other day, my wife and I was watching the show, and it, was, it wasn't a show, I forget what it was, but anyway, they were showing this, uh, a kid that's in Special Olympics that has, I forget what was wrong with him. And they were watching him, they were showing him running track, and they were saying, look at this kid. And he would run, and on a hard track, you guys know what tracks are like, they get, you get burns on, he would run, and then he would bite it, and it, it, was, so, it was so hard to watch, I was like, oh man, that had to hurt, because you know, I could feel the, the strawberries and all those things, if you've ever had any. And, and then he got up and he stumbled again. And then he got up and he stumbled again. And then he got up and stumbled again. And I'm like, I'm like, stay down. Just stay down. But this, because I was, I was feeling bad for him because I knew he was, had to be hurting. But this kid scrambled to his feet the whole time and finished his race. And I thought, that is a picture of what God says the righteous do. Yes, you're gonna stumble. Yes, you may fall flat on your face. Yes, you may do the worst thing possible, but the righteous always get right back up. We always get back up. Because we understand this principle that Paul talks about. I wanna do what's right, but my goodness, sometimes I just don't. My mind wants to, but my body says something else. Does anybody relate to this besides me? I mean. I mean, let me, let me just say this. Who in here is without sin? Yeah, because if you raise your hand, you know what we're gonna do? We'll come get you. We're gonna beat you all the way down this road. And then we're gonna crucify you and say, please die for us, we need help. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to raise their hand, watch our security team go whoop. Today is the day to get free if you want to. But we need help becoming self-disciplined because our self is always bent towards our sin nature. Does anybody, does anybody realize this? That's, that's why you, in a fight, that's why you say, man, I don't wanna do this, and I don't wanna do this, and then you go do it anyway. Then you feel bad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You feel bad and you're like, oh God, please, I, I repent, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I didn't wanna, and, and because we're fighting this nature, what God is saying, what the Apostle Paul is saying, with God, he can help you overcome these things. So, but as we get to know the word and act on it and confess it over our lives, we will develop better habits, better disciplines. Folks, we have to take this word, and let me, let me this word is life to all our flesh. And we have to take this word and we have to understand that we have to confess it over our lives. I have the mind of Christ. Greater is in me than he that's in the world. God, you sent your word and healed me and delivered me from all destruction. So I, I lay hands on my own self. Amen. You said lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, God, I'm believing you for health and healing. One of the things when my wife was here first service, we, 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 we never wake up, never, I mean never. And it's not that we're that holy or spiritual, but one of our confessions that we confess all the time is that we wake up or I wake up, Cynthia will say I wake up, happy and full of energy every day. So you know how we wake up? Happy and full of energy every day, and we don't drink coffee. Because you know, some people are like, don't talk to me, I don't want coffee. Then once you have the coffee, it's like, hey, what's happening? <laughs> well, I seriously wake up like that. I don't ever wake up in a bad mood. I don't ever wake up cranky, ever. Why? Because we confess life over our life. God did not make you a moody person. This world and lack of self-discipline made you a moody person. So if you're moody all the time, all you're doing is really trying to control everybody with your emotions. That's why I can't stand it. I've got to walk on eggshells around those people. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about now? How many they're sitting right next to you? Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> I tried to help a brother out. You're in trouble now. His wife's looking at him smiling like it's a, it's a smile of death. Today when you get home, you go to sleep, you die. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I, I'm playing. He put it up and put it down real quick like, Dude, you tricked me, my fault, my bad, dude. I, I'll take responsibility for that. <laughs> Only here. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27 says this. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? And I love this about the Apostle Paul. So run to win. Folks, these people in the Christian world that says we're not supposed to be competitive, they have no idea what they're talking about. Here the Apostle Paul is saying you gotta be competitive with what, with sin, with, the, with the, how the devil is, and we, we run to win. And let me say this, Paul had to be some kind of an athlete 
to use these examples because non-athletes don't get athletic type things or thoughts because most people, if you're, not, if you're not athletic, if you've never played sports, you don't understand them. For instance, when God speaks to me, he speaks to me sometimes like that. You know, I remember one time when I was meditating and God said, you know, it's like when you play basketball. Some people are the best shooters, some people are the best rebounders, and some people just feed everybody else. They pass the ball. And he said, that's how you gotta work in the church. You gotta constantly pass the ball and let them play. Let them go hoop it up. See, he uses some examples with me because I understand that. The one thing he never uses is knitting examples. <laughs> or crochet. Loop-de-loop, -loop, whatever it is. And you, you say, well, are you gonna give some knitting examples? No. You know why? Because I don't know. I just know you use two stick-looking things. That's all I know. I don't know what they're called. Stickers, I, I don't know. And what I'm saying to you is, don't look for God to speak to you in a way, when he gives you examples or anything, in a way that you don't know. You'll know. If you're an engineer, he's gonna talk to you like that. If you're an athlete, he's gonna talk to you like that. That's how God begins to speak to us. And we all get weirded out about it, but God, if he gave me a knitting example, I'd be like, what? <laughs> if he gives me a, you know, a, 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 an athletic example, I'm like, I got it. I get it, quick. And so Paul had to be some kind of athlete because non-athletes wouldn't use athletic terms. See, we don't want to see the apostles like that. So he's telling us, run to win. He's telling you, be competitive. You've got to win this thing. And listen, I like being number one. Amen. No one remembers who lost. And people say, well, but when you play sports against other people, do you want to win? Yes. I, do I, why, why do we go out there not wanting to win? Why do we do anything without wanting to win? If we're playing tiddlywinks, I'd want to beat you. My wife and I sometimes will sit down and play dominoes or backgammon. She gets so frustrated because I win most of the time. True story. She's like, how do you do this? I said, because I run to win. And I rub it in too, like, I'm number one, baby. You're not. I'm the champ. Did you see this? 20 to three. I'm I don't, I don't fare very well later, but in the moment, <laughs> that's why I gotta watch myself like, what do you want most, Steve? <laughs> and you gotta keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but it felt good at the moment, come on. So, so and my wife is so stinking competitive, she hates to lose. But Paul is saying, why do we wanna lose? Let's fight, let's win. And then he goes on to say, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for eternal prizes. We do it for eternal prize, a prize that never goes away, never fades away. So many of us have played sports, or you've been in speech and debate, chess team, whatever, and you've won awards and trophies, but when you get older, they mean nothing. Like when I moved out of my house, my mom boxed up all my trophies I had. I said, what is this? She goes, those are all yours. I'm like, I don't want those. So we kept them for a little bit, then we just threw them out one day. He said, why would you throw them out? Because they don't mean anything. Today, they don't mean one thing. Why? Because even that moment of glory fades away. Amen. Doesn't mean anything. But what we do for Christ is forever. Amen. That's the prize we want to win. So he says this, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. There's another example. He must have been a fighter of some kind. Like the Apostle Paul fought. I could see him fighting. He had a bad temper. You say, how do you know? Because he kicked my, okay, I don't have time. But I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Folks, that's the reality. That's what God is saying. That we've got we've to choose what we're, we're gonna do. We've gotta understand we have to discipline our body. We have to develop better habits. Go if you would to Proverbs chapter four. If you have a Bible, if you don't, it'll be on the screen. If you have your phone out, it should be on there. Proverbs chapter four. The word of God is so rich that we need to, listen to this, verse 20. My child, pay attention to what I say. 
Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. And I love this. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their own whole body. That the word of God is life to our flesh. That the word of God is that. And so when we choose what we want most over what we want now, we begin to run with purpose in every step. We aren't naturally disciplined. It's a skill to be developed, but the spirit that dwells within us helps us to become more disciplined in what matters most. By the power of Christ, we can develop better, healthier, godly habits if we believe in Jesus and the power of the word and realize I gotta get this word in me. Why do I gotta get the word in me? Because it's life to my whole being and health to my, all my flesh. The word of God is life. This isn't just a bunch of words on a page. This has power to it. This is life giving. This can change a life in a moment of time, forever and ever. That's why in Russia, when it was communist Russia, and now it's back almost there, they wouldn't even allow the Bible in. It was illegal to have Bibles. You had to smuggle them in. Why? Because here's what, the, here's what they found out, that when they would, people would get born again, they couldn't create the same kind of fear in them when they threatened them. That's what they found out. So we got to get rid of this. This changes lives and attitudes. So when they're beating people, they're looking at them like, I don't care what you do to me. You can kill me. I'm never going to back down. This is the only book that's been outlawed in any, almost a lot of the communist countries. Why? Because it's the only book that's life-giving. You can read all the books you want, but this is the only one that's life-giving. So we have to learn the word of God. We have to confess the word of God over our lives. We have to pray the word of God because it's life to our flesh. The Bible says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all destruction. He said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so I, I believe that. So I believe that's life to my flesh, my body. And so we, we have to come to a place where we spend Here's the thought. Get up 15 minutes earlier tomorrow. Start tomorrow. And in, in the first 15 minutes, spend 14 minutes and 24 seconds on reading the Bible, praying in this 14 minutes and 24 seconds, and then learning to be quiet before God. Because part of praying is learning to listen. Put a notepad and a pen by you, and just get quiet after you pray and read and say, God, I'm open, you speak to me. I need to learn to be more sensitive to your voice and the more you get in the word, the more you pray, the more sensitivity you have to when God's talking to you, you recognize it better. Doesn't mean we're 100% because none of us ever will be. And how God speaks to us most of the time is through our thoughts, he gives us thoughts. I'm not talking about an audible voice, but we learn to get quiet and still. We learn to discipline our bodies just for the, you know, I read the word for five minutes, I prayed for five minutes, the next whatever minutes, I'm just gonna be still and quiet and meditate on those things that I read and, and seek God. Because what people think is prayer time means do all the talking and don't do any listening. But if I'm gonna pray about things, I better want to know what, what you know, I need the wisdom of God and how to maybe walk that out or whatever we do. 14 minutes and 24 seconds a day, it's 1% of your day, can change your life. And after a year, they claim, you're gonna be 37% better in whatever area you're working on. That's a significant increase. And all it takes is one habit to shift the direction of our lives. Small things, small changes, 1%, 14 minutes and 24 seconds, can make a big difference. And here's what we learn as we walk in through this life. Life is hard. It is just hard. But you and I get to choose our hard. So I asked Pastor Keith Kraft, who spoke at our conference, I said, hey, can I have a list of those things you, you rattled off? And he sent it to me, and, he, and you know, so I'm giving him credit. The next time I use this, I don't give him any credit because then it'll be mine, but, but life is hard. And so you and I get to choose our habits, our disciplines. We get to choose our hard. We get to choose our habits. We get to choose our disciplines. But life is hard. How many of y'all know life is hard? God never said it would be easy. Not one time in the word he said it'd be easy. He said my yoke is easy, but he didn't say life would be easy. In fact, he said there'd be trouble. 
So we've got to learn what the Bible teaches. So choose your heart. Are you ready? Being your best is hard. Being your normal is hard. So when you go to work tomorrow, be your best. Making wise decisions is hard. Making bad decisions is hard. Being in shape is hard. Being out of shape is hard. Losing weight is hard. Being fat is hard. Working out is hard. Being weak is hard. Being disciplined is hard. Being lazy is hard. Getting out of your comfort zone is hard. Staying in your comfort zone is hard. Starting a business is hard. Working for someone else is hard. Making a lot of money is hard. Making a little bit of money is hard. Being rich is hard. And being poor is hard. Which one would you rather be? I'd rather be rich. One person said rich. What would we rather be? I'd rather be rich. I've been poor. I didn't like it at all. It was hard. And can I say something? Having, having money is hard. You know, years ago, there was a guy named Frank Gorm, who's still a good friend. He was on our board of directors. He helped us build this. He was, on a, he was a board member of the Wells Fargo Bank, and I know he guaranteed our loan back in the day when we didn't have as much as we have today. And he helped us secure the loan to build what we have here today. And, and he invited my wife and I to his house and he lived, he moved to North Carolina and he lived on what is called Figure Eight Island. If you Google it or whatever, it's a private island. His house was 10,000, 12,000 square feet, maybe even a little bigger. His backyard when you stepped off his porch was the Atlantic Ocean, was the beach of the Atlantic Ocean in a private beach. So the guys like own H&R Blocks, those guys are the ones that live in those areas. And so it was so incredible to me. All night long, you're hearing the waves of the ocean in your room when you're sleeping. I mean, it was beautiful. So we're sitting out on his beach, and he starts talking to me about all the headaches they have of losing their beach. And I'm like, what do you mean, how do you lose your beach? He said, when the hurricanes come and all these storms that we get, it just takes away our beach, and the water gets closer and closer to our house. And he said, we have to fight with the environmentalists and everybody pull up bunches of money, like big money, to be able to bring sand in and pump it in so they have more of a beach. And I remember sitting there thinking this, and I actually said it to him. I thought, man, that's a lot of stuff to deal with. So I looked at him, I said, hey, Frank, I love your house. I love this beach. And I said, but I never want one. And he looked and said, what? And I said, You just keep it and let me borrow it. Let me come and visit. And here's what I was saying. I don't want the responsibility of you having that. So whether you're poor or rich, there's responsibility. I would rather be praying about what to do with my wealth than praying and having to believe God to eat food, to pay my bills. But you get to choose. You're hard. You get to choose. God doesn't want anybody in here to stay where they can't pay their bills and and meet their needs. But we overspend. We get in big debt. And we don't honor God the way God says. And if we do, he'll just help you. You get to choose your heart. I don't know about you, I'd rather choose to have than not have. That's why I'm a tither. That's why I'm a giver. That's why I'm generous because I know the principle works, I know the word works, and folks, if you'd wanna choose, choose choose to be rich, choose to have, because it's worse when you don't. Having great relationships is hard. Having bad relationships is hard. Having friends is hard. Having no friends is hard. Fighting for your marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Having a lot of things is hard. Having nothing is hard. Living on purpose is hard. Living out of purpose or off purpose is hard. Doing life God's way is hard. Doing life your own way is hard. Everything is hard, so you choose your hard. It's your choice, nobody else's. It's your choice. You know one of the main themes at the Forge Men's Conference was letting things go that are in the past. And too many of us are carrying our junk, 
because we're choosing the hard and the pain of yesterday instead of what God could do today. And one of the things they did with the men God did, and we had almost, what, 2,000, 1,950 men or something here. The thing that God did was, man, they gotta let things go. We had altar time where men were in the altars letting their past go. And so folks, let me say this to you ladies and men, you gotta let your past go. You may have been hurt as a child, you may have been abused, and God helped the people that did that. And my heart goes out to you, but you can't live there and walk with God. You're living out of purpose instead of on purpose. You're choosing the wrong heart. That's why it's so difficult. Everything in life is hard. Let's choose the heart that benefits us the most. That's what God is saying. And all it takes is one habit that I said earlier to shift your whole life. Words direct our thoughts. Our thoughts direct our habits. And our habits shape our destiny. With God, choose the heart that helps you become better do better, be better, and live better. That's the hard you want. That's the hard that's the most benefit, has the most benefit. But you know what? You get to choose your heart. You get to choose your habits. So if it was me, and it is me, because I get to choose just like you do, I want to choose the hard that benefits me the most, that helps me do better, live better, be better, and honor God in a greater way. That's the heart we need to have. 1% every day, working on it. So if you know you have a bad habit, say tomorrow, I'm gonna get up 15 minutes earlier, I'm gonna work on this for 14 minutes and, or 20, 14 minutes and 24 seconds, I'm gonna work on it 1% of my day, and whatever it is, if you have an anger issue, you go to the scriptures where it talks about that anger, if you're an angry person, you're a foolish person. You talk about how God can heal your hurt and your pain, whatever it is, just 1% of your day. Get up 15 minutes early, read your Bible, pray, and then get quiet before the Lord. Because that's part of praying. How many, all choose, how many all ready to choose the better hearts than the worst hearts? Me too. Because I've chosen some of the bad ones and it, it's no fun. Either way, life is hard, but some have greater benefits than others. Let's choose the disciplines and the habits that help us. And let's say, God, forgive me for my sins. Because I have this sin nature I'm fighting, so you're not always gonna get it done. But because you're born again, you're, God made you righteous, you're gonna get up every time. Amen. Every time. Pastor, but you don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter what you've done. The righteous get up seven times. Every time. That's what God wants for all of us. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for helping us all. I thank you, Father, that your word is true. And the Father, we're gonna choose your path, your journey, your way, over every other way. It's all gonna be hard, but at least, with, at least with what we choose about you, you help us through that hard. Help us develop better habits and, and disciplines in our life. Help us, God. With every head bowed, please no one looking around or moving at this time, and if you're online, same to you. Just still for a moment. If you're here and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. I want to come home. You're right. I need to get back up. I've messed up. I've been hurt, whatever it is, but I know I need to come home. This is how it begins right here. Or if you're here and you said, I've never given Jesus my life. I never have. I was brought here. I came here, but I've never given God permission to my life. And the God we serve, guys, just so you know, is the God of another chance. Not the first, second, third, or fourth chance. He's always the God of another chance. And I thank God he's not the God of the second chance, the third chance, or fourth chance, because I need him to be the God of a millionth chance. That's why he's the God of another chance. Doesn't matter how far you've gone, what you've done, God is still for you, and he's still calling you home. So if that's you with every head bowed and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? Right where you're seated, I'm gonna pray with you. But I'm gonna ask you to do something for me. For two reasons, what I'm gonna ask you to do. Number one, the first and biggest reason is you need to have in your heart and mind, I don't care what anybody else thinks, I just want God in my life. 
God, I want you in my life. The second thing is I want to know if I'm praying for anybody. And that moment of clarity, that moment of confession, if you would, where you lift your hand, that's a type and form of confessing Christ before men, not being ashamed of him. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. That's why I'm asking you to do what I'm asking you to do. Now, in a moment, without any hesitation, if you say, preacher, that's me, would you pray for me right where you're seated in the powerful name of Jesus? Are you ready? In Jesus' name, with no hesitation, right now, in Jesus' name. If that's you, you say, pray for me, would you lift your hand right where you're seated? God bless you. 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 Thank you so much. As I look across the top, God bless you. Thank you. God bless you over here. As I look across the top now, God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else as I look across the top section, you just lift your hand and thank you, sir. I see your hand. God cares. That's what you guys got to, we got to understand. He loves us and cares, but you get to choose your heart. Life is hard. Choose the devil's route and it's harder. At least with God, you got help and you get forgiveness. I'm going to look across the top one more time. Anybody else? Say, preacher, you got me. I'm, I, I'm ready. And I, thank you. All you're doing is yielding to God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All you're doing is saying yes to God. I can't save you. This church can't save you. Only you believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus can cause you to be saved or born again. Anybody else as I look across the bottom section? One last time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? Father, in the powerful, powerful name of Jesus. You saw all those hands, so many. Lives that are saying, I want you in my life. And so, God, you said, if we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. They're calling. So I thank you for their salvation. I thank you for saving them today. As they pray and invite you into their world, in Jesus' name. If that's you and you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me right where you're seated, loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. I want everybody in here that's right with God to pray with us in support of those. And then if you didn't lift your hand, but you know you should have, I want you to pray this prayer with us. I'm gonna introduce you to my friend Jesus because he's the only one that can save you. Would you pray this with me? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe... On the third day, you raised him from the dead. Now, according to your word, I believe that in my heart. And now I willingly confess with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for helping me develop better habits, better disciplines in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Let's thank God, church.